All right, well, thanks for joining me today as we discuss uh, solutions for storing and using ethanol gasoline fuels. Uh, I am Eric Bjornstad. I am the Technical Information Director for Bell Performance here in Central Florida. And so uh, what we want to do today is uh, we want to uh, really try to help you better understand uh, the important facts of the matter when it comes to this issue of ethanol in gasoline. Now there's a lot of opinion, there's a lot of conjecture that's flying around on both sides of the issues, the people for it and the people who are against it. But you know, wherever you're at, what you really need to know, where you're interested in, is getting, get, getting your head around these questions of what is ethanol going to do for me versus what problems is it going to cause for me uh, how do I prevent those problems if it's, you know, if, if that's even possible to do? Uh, and what should I do about them when I see them, right? So to make sure that we accomplish this, we want to talk about how fuel has changed along with the reasons why those changes happened. We want to cover the pros and the cons of the ethanol issue. And we say pros and cons because nothing in life is ever completely good and completely bad. There's, there's things to be said on both sides, so we want to cover both sides of the issue there. We will also cover what you need to know about how today's ethanol blended gasolines affect what you use them in, like your engines and your equipment. And we want to discuss the best practices for getting around any potential negative issues or problems linked to ethanol. So, all that being said, let's start off with the acknowledgement that whether we like it or not, things in life do change. Change is inevitable. Some things change for the better. Some things, unfortunately, change for the worse. And, you know, when it comes down to it, sometimes we think that a given change is bad when it actually turns out to be the opposite. Now, when you're talking about fuel, the fuels that we have today are markedly different from the fuels that we had access to two, three, four, five decades ago. And the changes in these fuels have come about as a response to a couple of things. They've come, out as, come about as a response to the needs of consumers, which would be essentially market-based changes or response to the market, as well as fuels that have changed to meet the needs of the machines that they are used in. Now, first point you see there, cracked fuel stocks. Now, uh, these are some of the big changes. First one being a higher use of cracked fuel stocks in blending or composing today's gasolines. Uh, today, you've got a greater demand for fuel than really ever before in human history. Just think about how just in the United States there are more drive you know how many more drivers, how many more consumers uh we have today than we ever had before, and they all have energy demands. And yet, uh if you look at you know nineteen eighty two, you go back uh what, thirty five years or so. Uh nineteen eighty two there were three hundred and one active refineries in the United States and they were producing, they had a refining capacity of about 17 million barrels of fuel per day is what they could produce. Uh, go to 2013, so let's say 30 years later, the United States has uh, 139 refineries, and they still have a capacity of 17 million barrels a day, which means they have less than half of the refineries uh, online over a 30-year period producing twice as much fuel. So you've got ever-increasing numbers of consumers also in developing countries, all going after a relatively finite pool of oil and petroleum when you're talking when, when you're talking about a worldwide basis. Uh, but the ability, the ability to turn you know the crude oil that's pulled out of the ground into the things that these burgeoning consumers want, you know the thing to to, to meet their energy demands, so to speak. Um, the refining capacity of these groups, you know, they they struggled. They really struggled to keep up. And in order for refineries to meet this demand from consumers, they have to squeeze out more gasoline and more diesel from each barrel of crude oil than ever before. Now, how do they do this? Well, 
In order to do this, petroleum chemists have had to develop new processes, new methods that maximize the yield of the distillate fuels. And these processes are called cracking processes. And they really, these cracking processes are really essential to enabling the refineries to maximize the yield of gasoline and diesel and other distillate fuels from the crude oil. Now, back in the 1970s, or I should say back before the 1970s, if you looked at each barrel of crude um, and you looked at what they were getting out of it when they'd send it to the refinery, you would get about 50% distillate fuel content out of each barrel of crude oil. Now, with all these cracking advances that they have, they can actually get 90, 92, 93% distillate content out of each barrel of crude. Uh, so that's good, right? Well, the downside, though, is that the fuel that they make from what they call these cracked feedstocks, the fuels that they blend from those, uh, while they technically can be defined as gasoline or diesel, when you really look at them, they're inherently less stable. They don't burn as cleanly, and they don't last anywhere near as long as sto in storage as the virgin fuels from decades past. And then the other big set of changes, these, the environmental mandates. Uh, the other big set of changes for fuel came about as a result of environmental mandates from the government, specifically the Clean Air Act. Now, the Clean Air Act uh, has seen a number of iterations, and we really go back to the iterations of 1986 through 1992. So the Clean Air Act of 1986 and 92 was the key fulcrum when we talk about laws that spurred changes to our fuels with the goals of making a cleaner environment. Um, this resulted in a number of really substantial or significant changes to the composition of both gasoline and diesel fuel. Now on the diesel side, uh, you have ultra-low sulfur diesel being the essentially base fuel of the land now. Um, you've got the fact that from 1992 through to about 2006, they reduced the sulfur content in diesel fuel by 99.7%. That's a lot less sulfur uh, going out into the air, and there's a lot less of this acid rain damage. So that's a good thing. Now, on the gasoline side, a big change in the fuel was mandatory legal inclusion of injector detergency into gasoline. Now, automotive scientists uh, recognize pretty easily that a major cause of air pollution is or was incomplete combustion of the fuel. And they also linked that the single biggest cause of poor fuel combustion were injector deposits. Now, injector deposits, they happen because you get gums and you get varnishes and you get these uh, carbonaceous deposits that the, the components of those are already in the fuel. And so when you send that fuel through an injector, um, the inject some of that may stay in the injector pintle, you know, in the tip. They react with the heat. They 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 may cook in that 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 injector tip there, and they form deposits that eventually build up and they start to skew the effectiveness of the injector at the delivering the fuel in its optimal atomized form into the combustion chamber. And that means that the fuel is not going to get burned as optimally and the engine is not going to be as efficient as it should be. So in order to combat this problem, the government mandated that all on-road gasolines had to have at least a minimum level of injector detergency added to them before they reach the consumer at the gas station. And say what you want about government interference, you know, this government interference in the marketplace and government telling us what to do and whatnot. You know, you can say what you want about that, but this mandate, this detergency mandate, really seems to have accomplished what they set out to do uh, as one of the major parts of some really overall big changes in gasoline. Uh, you know, combined with significant technological advances in engine efficiency and design, it's pretty clear that the vehicles of today are much cleaner and much more efficient than they used to be. And so that is definitely good for the environment that we all share. So, Clean Air Act, 
The Clean Air Act, with all of its various updates over the years, has been really significantly responsible for fuel changes that have had a meaningful, positive impact on our environment. But there's another significant piece of government legislation that is directly responsible for the presence of ethanol in gasoline today, ultimately responsible for the bottom line subject to what we're talking about, the ethanol. That piece of legislation is the Renewable Fuels Standard. When you pair the Renewable Fuels Standard with the Clean Air Act, together they both have been the, the primary legislative mandates that have forced change in the marketplace to help clean up the environment. And you can't really can't get a clear picture of why we're here today and how we got to the point of where we are today where we're talking about ethanol and fuel. You can't get a clear picture of, of how that happened without talking about both of these in tandem. Now, as we said earlier, the Clean Air Act uh, significantly changed the diesel landscape by mandating the removal of sulfur from diesel fuel. But the Clean Air Act on the gasoline side here, the Clean Air Act also did something pretty significant, and that is it required, it forced a change in the makeup of gasoline to force the inclusion or the use of oxygenating compounds in gasoline with the goal of lowering the production of harmful emissions associated with urban air pollution. So you've got that, and then that leads us to the other piece of legislation we said that we talked about in tandem, the Renewable Fuel Standard, otherwise known as the RFS. RFS really came about around 2005. And in a nutshell, what the RFS did was created a mandate, created a requirement that nationwide we were going to use X billions of gallons of renewable fuels uh, derived from renewable energy sources in a given year. And so this, you know, when you're talking about why we are where we're at today, this is the bottom line reason why we have biodiesel in our diesel fuel and ethanol in our gasoline. So as we will find out later, it's not the only reason why we have ethanol in our gasoline. Now, one other thing to point out here as we start digging into this, um, the renewable fuel standard, like we said, it's a piece of legislation, it's an act. It's the congressional mandate for the use of biofuels. Now, it's important to remember that because many times people misunderstand who's ultimately responsible for the whole, you know, the, the whole debate about ethanol and gasoline. They talk about or they hear about, you know, the EPA this and the EPA that. And so they start to associate the EPA with this requirement to have ethanol and gasoline. But in reality, the EPA is just is a government agency and they act as the enforcement or the implementation arm for the regulation. The EPA is not the one that in the, that invented the rule that you had to use ethanol. It is Congress that created that rule. Congress makes the laws Congress is the one that issues the mandate or the requirement to use ethanol and fuel. And it is the EPA's job is to do what Congress tells it to do. So we had the RFS is the legislative reason why we have ethanol in our fuel. But there are a couple of also a couple of practical issues that we have to consider to fully understand if we want to fully understand why we have ethanol gasoline. And those practical issues are ethanol's dual role as both an oxygenate and an octane improver. So, we'll call again. The Clean Air Act is the thing that created the mandate to change gasoline to reduce air pollution. Now, on the fuel side, what that did was it created, or it, it, it caused the creation of what they might call boutique fuels. Some people call them reformulated gasolines, if you've heard that term before reformulated gasolines that have special ingredients added to them that make the gasolines burn cleaner. So this meant, this is where we get the introduction of oxygenates to the country's gasoline fuel supply to reduce urban air pollutants like carbon monoxide. An oxygenate, simply put, is something that increases the oxygen content of fuel. If you have more oxygen in the fuel, 
It means it produces fewer harmful emissions like carbon monoxide when it's burned in an internal combustion engine. Then on the other side, the market side, you've got the issue that the gasoline that's produced by the refineries, when they go to use it on the end user level, it has to burn properly in the engines that use it. That means primarily it has to have sufficient octane rating to ensure that it burns efficiently and without causing problems in the engine like pre-detonation. So if you have two sides here, if you have government that's mandating that you have to do this, and then you have the market that's saying, well, yeah, but the, the we also have to have gasoline that performs well for us. If you have both of those things together at the same time, ideally you want to have something that you can add to the fuel that satisfies both sides, right? It satisfies the oxygenate mandate from the government, and it also gives the marketplace what they need by functioning as an octane improver. So what did they do to try and balance these two things? Well, prior to the Clean Air Act of 1986, they really didn't have to worry about oxygenates. You know, they didn't have the oxygenate requirement. They just had what the market required, which was sufficient octane rating. So they just really worried about octane improvers. And so starting in the 1920s, they came up with tetraethyl lead, TEL. Tetraethyl lead is a liquid-soluble form of lead, and it was added to gasoline to serve two purposes. First thing was it's an octane improver. Second thing is tetraethyl lead provided a lubricant effect for valves that normally would suffer wear and damage over time. So it helped cushion and lubricate the valve to make them last longer. Now, if you're old enough that you were driving before, say, the 1970s, then you probably well remember the red-dyed ethyl fluid that was supplied to gas stations by the ethyl corporation. That was tetraethyl lead. But in the 1970s, they start the process, they start phasing out tetraethyl lead, and they had good reasons for doing this. They start mandating unleaded gasoline because what they found was the lead in the leaded gasoline damaged the catalytic converters that had become standard issue on car models starting in the mid-70s. And they also found that it fouled spark plugs, and that's a problem. Plus, there were also significant health concerns and fears about lead in the environment, especially uh, with its potential effects on children. So the United States starts phasing it out of the gasoline, and the, fin the United States has a final ban on leaded gasoline in 1996, and that is followed by basically everyone else in the world. The, U, the EU, European Union, follows in 2000, and by you know the early 2000s, you know, 2003, 2004, 5, almost every significant country in the world has banned leaded gasoline. Um, the last country of note to ban it, the kind of the final one, was I think Serbia in 2010. And as of today, you know, 2017, 2018, uh, it, leaded gasoline is really only legal in like six <laughs> six countries around the world. You got Algeria, Iraq, Yemen. Uh, so that's three Middle Eastern countries. You got Afghanistan. You got Myanmar, and then the last one are good friends up in North Korea. So, with lead now out as an option, they still have the problem of how do they raise the octane in gasoline. So they start to, you know, they start to have to look at other alternatives. Um, when you talk about these things, they're looking at what they call anti-knock agents. And anti-knock agents are classified as either high percentage agents or low percentage agents. And the distinction between the two is how much they have to add in order to get whatever desired octane improvement they need. Now, low percentage additives are ones that contain heavy metal elements like iron or manganese. Um, and the two dominant options there are these things called MMT and ferrocene. Now, MMT, MMT is an acronym. Uh, without going into the very long uh, 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 meaning of it, it's a, it's a manganese complex. It's an organometallic molecule that contains the heavy metal manganese. 
and it was developed as an octane improver in 1974. Now, the EPA was never really you know, fully comfortable with possible health effects of manganese emissions, just like you know, lead emissions. But they have court battles that rage on in the 1990s, and the EPA finally caves in, grants a waiver for the use of MMT in gasoline as an octane improver. So great, problem solved. Well, no, not really. Because unfortunately, even though MMT uh, you know, raises octane, it still hasn't proved to be feasible <clears throat> for nationwide use. Nationwide use being key. Large scale use across the entire country as a replacement for lead. So MMT can do the job, but it's not feasible on a large scale. What about ferrocene? Ferrocene is an iron complex, an iron molecule, organometallic iron molecule. They were discovered in the 1950s. Then research to develop it for use in fuel was done by the 1970s. Now, ferrocene, it can raise gasoline octane rating, but like MMT, you know, it's a heavy metal complex, so it has health concerns. And like MMT, it leaves damaging deposits on both spark plugs and in catalytic converters. Now, it's also interesting to note there are some fuel additives out there that are not hard to find if you go looking for them. They are ferrocene based and they claim to be based on technology that won a Nobel Prize in Chemistry in the early 70s, specifically referring to the 1973 Nobel Prize for Chemistry that was given out for work on these things called metallocenes, which really doesn't have anything to do with a ferrocene for, uh, for fuel additive form, but they make the claims anyway because it sounds impressive and it fools people into thinking that you know, their fuel additive is what won the Nobel Prize in 1973. Yeah. So MMT and ferrocene, ganometallic complex, low percentage additives, that can raise octane, but not feasible for national use. So in the time that you know they're still searching for the large scale answer to this, refineries start using things like organic compounds. They start blending in organic, purely organic molecules like benzene, isooctane, certain kinds of alkylates and aromatics. And you know these are more advantageous than uh, uh, you know an iron-based additive or a manganese-based additive because you know refineries already deal in organic compounds, so refineries can already they're already being handled by the refinery. But unfortunately, even these ones, even these ones like benzene and isooctane, have their own drawbacks in terms of when you start getting down to issues of toxicity and carcinogenicity. So now as we move towards the late 1970s, MTBE starts to emerge as a viable solution here. Now MTBE is an acronym that stands for methyl tert-butyl ether. The ether is the notable part because, if you remember from your high school chemistry days, ethers are molecules that contain oxygen. That means not only does oct uh, uh, MTBE raise octane in gasoline, but it also functions as an oxygenate. That means we now have something that satisfies both issues. Issue number one, oxygenation of the fuel for emissions. Issue number two, raising the fuel's octane supply to meet the demands of the marketplace. Now, MTBE's use, even though it was started to be developed in the 19, late 70s, its use in gasoline on a wide scale really didn't accelerate until the Clean Air Act requirements began to be fully phased in in the early 1990s. And so MTBE was thought to be an ideal solution. And because of that, MTBE really was the first oxygenate in widespread use in response to the Clean Air Act requirements. And when we say widespread use, we are not kidding. At its peak in the late 1990s, like let's say 1998, I think, there were about 8.5 million gallons of MTBE per day that were being produced and blended into the nation's gasoline supply, typically at around 10% volume. However, again, 
no good thing ever lasts, and unfortunately they start fielding complaints about MTBE contaminating drinking water. So you might have a gas station that has an old storage tank, uh, and because these storage tanks are underground, you know, you can't really see what their condition is, and so maybe that gas tank that holds gasoline in it that's got 10% MTBE, maybe it develops a leak. It starts to rupture. That gasoline, that MTBE, starts leaking into the community's water supply. Now, MTBE in and of itself is not, you know, overtly poisonous or carcinogenic, you know, carcinogenic, something like that. The problem with MTBE is that a tiny amount of MTBE can make a lot of water taste really bad. It is so powerful at doing this. You can detect MTBE in drinking water at the part per billion level. Um, if you do the math, you could take less than 8,000 gallons of MTBE, and that would be enough to contaminate and make, you know, make undrinkable, basically, enough drinking water to serve the entire Earth's population. In just less than 8,000 gallons of MTB would do that. Remember that in 1999, we were using 8.5 million gallons per day. So, that's a problem. Year 2000, AEPA says, right, we got to get MTB out of the gasoline. <laughs> Excuse me, they draft a four-year phase-out plan for MTB. States start banning MTB for use in on-road gasoline in 2005. And so MTB is on its way out, but they have to replace it with something because, they remember, they still have those rules. What are you going to replace it with? What are you going to pick? Well, uh, you know, when it comes down to it, there are hundreds of different possibilities. There's lots of things out there that are soluble in gasoline and that contain al uh, c contain uh, oxygen. But if you're really going to settle on something to to use on a wide scale basis, then it has to have certain properties. Uh, it's got to be inexpensive to make. It's got to be cheap. Number one, it's got to be easy to produce in large quantities, millions of gallons per day. It has to be easy to produce in large quantities. It has to be safe to handle. I mean, you do want it to be safe to handle. You don't want people being poisoned or being blown up trying to handle this stuff, right? And it has to be easy to transport as well because they're going to produce it in certain areas and then transport it to where it's needed. So it has to be easy to transport. So cheap, easy to produce in large quantities, safe to handle, easy to transport. If they're going to phase out MTBE as an octane improver, they still need to satisfy the congressional mandate for oxygenation of gasoline. They have to replace it with something. So what are they going to choose? Well, when you factor all of those things together, the best candidate that satisfies all of those requirements turned out to be the one that they ended up choosing, the one we have today, ethyl alcohol or ethanol. So to meet all those requirements, ethanol pro proved to be the best solution. And ethanol, this is where we start talking about the good with ethanol. Ethanol has some advantages that made it relevant to solving these needs. Advantage number one, a high octane content. Pure ethanol has an octane content of around 109, uh, you know, 108, 109, 110, depending on what source you look at. Not quite as high as MTBE, which can actually range between 115 and 130, but high nonetheless. In fact, high octane rating is one reason why ethanol and other alcohols like methanol tend to make good racing fuels. And it means that it can also be used as an octane booster to help make up and improve gasoline octane value. Second advantage, it has it's easy to make. It's easy to make. It's easy to distribute. You can make ethanol. I mean, we all know you can make ethanol from corn. Uh, other countries make it from crops like sugarcane, which is what Brazil does, and they are really good and efficient at doing that. Um, you know, <clears throat> you can make it pretty easily. Been doing it for centuries. Today, the United States produces, I think it's over 14 billion gallons of fuel ethanol every year. 
And that number, um, at least up to around 2014, 2015, had been increasing relatively steady, steadily, I should say. Uh, you go back to the year 2000, they were making 1.6 billion gallons of fuel ethanol a year. Ten years later, it was 13 billion gallons, you know, and today we're at, you know, we're peaking out between 14 and 15 billion gallons of fuel ethanol each year. And that brings us to where we are today. So <clears throat> unless they change the law, unless they do away or amend the requirements of the renewable fuel standard, uh, you know, for for all those people that talk about how terrible ethanol is and how it just needs to go, it's not going anywhere. Ethanol is here to stay for the foreseeable future. So uh, we have to talk. You know, m maybe we need we we have to talk about what's good about it and what's bad about it and how it has changed the fuels that we use today on a functional level. Now. We're going to spend plenty of time talking about the bad in ethanol. But like I said at the very beginning, nothing in life is ever completely good or completely bad. There's elements of good and bad in most things. And there were reasons why they put ethanol in the gasoline in the first place. Some of them we've already alluded to. First one reduces emissions from gasoline. <coughs> Excuse me. The whole reason to put ethanol in fuel was so that it could reduce the emissions that the fuel creates when it is burned. In other words, to improve air quality. And to that end, it's done exactly that. Um, you know, you put ethanol in gasoline at the typical, you know, like 10% level, you get reduced carbon monoxide emissions by 20 to 30%. And then second one, reduces oil consumption. Um, it does help reduce the amount of oil we use uh, simply because if you're if you've got E10, if you've got 10% ethanol content in gasoline, that's 10% of that gasoline's volume that's not from being made from petroleum. So that means you're using less oil. So those are a couple of the main good points about ethanol. And so that then leads us we have to talk about the bad both on how the properties of the gasoline have been changed by addition of ethanol and how the gasoline behaves in the engine and in storage. Those have also been changed and not for the better. These are the roots of the ethanol problems that you hear about. So let's start when, when, you, talk, when you talk about the bad, taking the bad with ethanol. Let's start at the macro level and talk about the economics. First thing that we need to consider is fuel ethanol's effect on food prices. And that's not something a lot of people think about it, but it is a very real problem. Today, we're at the point where, depending on what source you're looking at, anywhere from 25 to 40 percent of our nation's corn supply is not being used to create food. It's being diverted to make fuel ethanol to go in our nation's gasoline. Now think about all the things that we consume that that have corn content in them. All of those things, the prices for all of those things have been going up because there's a shortage of corn. So, um, you know, pork and beef and dairy, all of those items that contain high fructose corn syrup. Think about all those items. Uh, you talk about the poultry industry, so you talk about chicken, you talk about eggs, corn is the most expensive element in raising chickens, so that affects the prices of, 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 of eggs. So on a general level, the ethanol mandate has made many kinds of food more expensive. Second thing is, the higher the ethanol content in gasoline, the lower your mileage is going to be. Now, ethanol by volume, contains about 70% of the energy of the comparable volume of gasoline. This is because ethyl alcohol, it's a two-carbon alcohol. It's a small molecule with fewer carbons than the molecules in gasoline. And so if you have fewer carbons, you have less energy value when that molecule is combusted. So you don't get as much energy value from the ethanol when you're burning it. This reduces the mileage that you get with the fuel. Now, how much mileage? This is where we have to start backing back, backing out a little bit and saying, look, you get lower mileage 
but you have to be realistic about what that loss is. At the E10 level, you're talking about a 3 to 4% reduction in fuel economy. Now, for the average driver driving a car, they get 25 miles a gallon, they drive, you know, 12,000 miles a year, something like that, and gas is, you know, 250 a gallon, something like that. You're talking about 50 to 100 dollars a year in extra gas. Uh, you know, for fleets, for let's say municipalities that have large numbers of gas-powered municipal vehicles that are out doing municipal business, you're going to have you know, you're going to take that loss. You're going to multiply it out proportionately. You're going to have a significantly higher total loss. And when you talk about E85, those E85 users experience even more higher significant mileage losses. So. Ethanol lowering mileage costs both consumers and it costs businesses as well. Now, depending on your professional capacity, if you've got one, um, you know something like uh, you know lower fuel economy, you might not care that much about that. It might only be a you know a minor inconvenience. What you might really be concerned about is ethanol's effects on certain types of materials and the damage that ethanol fuel causes for certain kinds of equipment. See, not long after E10 became the dominant fuel of the land around, you know, 2006, 2007, people started reporting widespread, you know, destructive damage to their small equipment. And you go talk to a small equipment repair shop, they will tell you they saw sharp upticks in their business because of this. The ethanol fuel what it was doing it was eating through fuel lines. It was corroding small engine carburetors. It was causing damage that rendered that small equipment inoperable. And this problem stemmed from what, what we would call ethanol solvency tendencies, where the ethanol, as it remains in contact with these rubber and these plastic parts, it dissolves them slowly over time. It dissolves them, it compromises their integrity, um, and this affects both consumers and businesses. The only difference is the scale of the problem. You know, a consumer that has a weed eater, the weed eater doesn't work anymore. They have to go buy a new one. A you know, a golf course that has 50 pieces of small equipment now has 25 of those pieces that are inoperable. They got to go buy 25 weed eaters, which is not a small outlay. And there's also concerned about two-stroke engine damage with ethanol use because ethanol attracts water from the air, pulls water into the fuel, into the gasoline, and this water interferes with the fuel, you know, the fuel oil lubrication that two-stroke engines rely on, and you get catastrophic engine damage and engine failure that happens as a result. Again, the cost of this problem, just the same as the one before, it increases in scale when you compare when when you look at a municipality or a business that has larger numbers of small equipment. And lest one think that this problem is overstated at all, this concern about, you know, its effect, ethanol's effects on small engines, it's a big enough concern that small engine manufacturers like Echo and Briggs and Stratton they specifically warn against using E15 fuel in small engines because E15 has even higher ethanol content than E10, and the higher the ethanol content, the more magnified the small engine problem is. So now we start getting into the fun stuff. Uh, you know, we talked about effects on small engines, we talked about mileage and food prices. Well, now let's talk about storage stability. We've already mentioned ethanol has problems with water. We've alluded to how those water problems affect small engines. But that is small potatoes compared to the storage problems that ethanol gasoline has. And that's because if someone, if a business is storing ethanol, they're storing thousands of gallons of it. Well, thousands of gallons cost thousands of dollars. And ethanol water issues are a huge and significant concern for anyone who stores ethanol blended gasoline. Now, when you talk about storing it, ethanol blended gasoline is a markedly shorter storage life than conventional gasoline. According to some sources, it can be as little as 28 days. Now, before they put ethanol in gasoline, when you had straight run gas, 
storage life for gasoline was one to two years without any problems. Easy. So what exactly, how, what exactly is happening where you go from one to two years to 28 days? Well, diesel fuel also has reduced storage life, but its storage problems are tied to its susceptibility to microbial activity, and also because of the cracked fuel stocks, you remember oxidative instability, you know, developing gums and varnishes at an accelerated rate over time. That's diesel fuel. Ethanol storage problems are directly related to problems of phase separation. And phase separation has everything to do with ethanol's affinity for attracting water. So to understand this phenomenon of phase separation, first thing you do, you have to understand that most alcohols are what they call hygroscopic. They have the chemical ten tendency to attract water from the environment around them. Now, the ethanol that's blended in the gasoline, you know, the E10 gasoline that you buy at the pump, when it's when it's uh, you know when it's new, it exists in a seamless blend: 10% ethanol content, 90% gasoline, seamlessly and homogeneously blended in a stable blend. But over time, that fuel starts to attract water, and that water starts to get pulled into the fuel and starts to get dissolved. The the alcohol helps dissolve that water into the fuel. Now, each particular gasoline blend has a limit, has a natural limit on the amount of water that it can dissolve. And once that limit is exceeded, what happens is that the fuel undergoes this process called phase separation. It's the name for the phenomenon when the ethanol in the fuel becomes unstable and starts to separate out from the fuel blend. So the alcohol comes out of solution, and it comes out of solution mixed with at least part of the water that it helped pull into the fuel. And this alcohol water layer is now heavier than the fuel, so what happens to it? It naturally sinks down and accumulates at the bottom of the tank. Now, how much water can cause phase separation? Well, it uh, turns out not very much. Uh, in fact, as little as half a percent by volume can typically can start this process. And that is literally, uh, for a gallon of fuel, that's like a two teaspoons of fuel. It is very, very little. So then the question now becomes, so what? You know, phase separation happens in gasoline. So what? Why should we care if this happens? Well, we should care because phase separation is a problem because... Once phase separation happens in fuel, you get some serious issues with that fuel. Issue number one, um, it destroys fuel quality and can damage valves and cause engine damage. If phase separation happens in an engine fuel tank or if some of that phase separated fuel, let's say you get it from a distributor that's not taking care of the fuel. The engine, if it tries to burn it, can suffer serious damage if it tries to burn any of that alcohol water mix because the alcohol water, when it goes in the combustion chamber, it actually burns at a significantly higher temperature than the gasoline does. That can cause valve damage very quickly. Second problem is when phase separation happens in gasoline, the gasoline that's left behind as the top layer in that tank has been stripped of some significant amount of its octane value. That means that it is now very poor quality gasoline uh, that likely may not run correctly in whatever is using it. Now, this second point is very important to, to consider. See, many times, you know, you have a fuel blender, and they are they know that they have to produce an 89-octane or a 91-octane rating fuel. They also know at the same time they have to put 10% ethanol content in there. So they know that they can make up some of that octane value with the ethanol that they're putting it in. So what they do is they take a lower octane base stock, they take that, they add 10% ethanol content to that, and it raises the overall octane rating up to where it needs to be. Now, if that some or all of that alcohol separates out, what happens? Well, it takes that supplemental octane value with it, and it takes additional octane value with it because 
there are certain organic constituents in the fuel that normally would help contribute to the octane volume of that fuel. Well, they can get dissolved in that alcohol and they get carried out with the alcohol. So now, instead of an 89 octane fuel, you might be looking at an 84 or an 83 octane fuel, which is going to cause problems if you try to use it. So phase separation, bottom line, phase separation is the primary danger to stored ethanol gasoline fuel health. And it is a primary reason, probably the most important reason why gasoline storage life today is so much shorter than it used to be. Now, what about water attraction and storage tank corrosion? Storage tank corrosion is an expensive concern for business customers. Uh, storage tank corrosion, this is the place where your expenses can really, really add up. And corrosion in storage tanks can result from several factors that are related to ethanol fuel storage. First factor is what we just mentioned, the water attraction. The, um, there is, uh, you know, when you get water that's pulled into the fuel, where water and metal, you know, when, when they're in close proximity to each other, they start to react, starts to cause corrosion. There's also an element of the ethanol alcohol itself being corrosive to metal parts over time, but the water drawn in by the ethanol fuel is the biggest, uh, 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 biggest culprit here. Second one is what they call acid vapor corrosion from alcohol consuming microbes. Um, and this is something that they have really been trying to get a handle on over the last five, six years. Storage tank operators in that time have begun to see significant corrosion damage due, they think, to the presence of acid producing bacteria that feed on the ethanol, they convert it to acetic and other lightweight kinds of acids that then corrode storage tanks. So microbes, microbes are linked to this phenomenon, this phenomenon of what they call microbially induced corrosion because the microbes' biological activities result in the production of these acidic byproducts that then cause corrosion and attack tank surfaces. So these microbes, the acids that they produce, they tend to be lightweight acids. We already said acetic acid, which is a small acid molecule. You've also got ones like methanoic acid or carbonic acid. And when these acids are produced by these microbial life cycles, they First, they produce corrosive damage in areas below the fuel line, but then also, interestingly enough, what they do is they also will volatilize. They'll turn into vapor, and they will actually rise up into the vapor space above the fuel line, and they'll settle on metal parts in the vapor space up there, and they will start cause corrosive damage up in that area above the fuel. Now, unless you think that this problem is understated again, um, they have been able to observe that there are some kinds of bacteria that have been known to be able to perforate a 5 millimeter thickness of 316 steel in little more than one month time. Now that's an extreme case, but it serves to illustrate that microbial corrosion can cause serious damage in ethanol storage tanks in a lot shorter time than you might think. So, from a business standpoint, it's one thing to spend money on replacing a piece of equipment like a a a lawnmower or a uh, you know a, a a a piece of you know lawn equipment. Um, <clears throat> it's another thing to see you know higher fuel costs. Your fuel budget costs start to get strained because your mileage has gone down. But when you start factoring in damage from tank corrosion, that's when it starts to get really really expensive for businesses and entities that really are on tight budgets to begin with. So, given all these potential problems that we've been talking about for the last 45 minutes or so, given these potential problems that ethanol blended gasoline can cause for you, the question now becomes, what are the best practices to either solve these problems or prevent the problems from happening in the first place? So. In our time remaining that we're talking about this, we want to focus this discussion in to more of a problem versus solution focus. What are each of these main problems in the areas you're likely to be involved in, and what are the recommendations for solving those problems? So, 
first one that we looked at, first one that we talked about, damage to small engines. The problem is that ethanol contributes to damage to rubber and plastic parts, as well as damage to small engines because of the lubrication issue. And it also caused damage in small engine uh, carburetors. Problems, what is the cause? Problem is caused by the dissolving of polymer components by the ethanol and the interference with the fuel oil lubrication by the dissolved water that's been pulled in by the ethanol fuel. Now, remember, this is a side note. When we're talking about small engine damage, uh, people, uh, uh, when they, you know, they know that ethanol can damage small engines, but they don't know how it reacts with their cars. And you know, when it comes down, bottom line, you're going to be a lot more concerned about damage to your car than you're going to be about damage to your chainsaw. So you have to remember, and this may be a little bit, you know, shall we say, reassuring. We have to remember that small engines are still significantly behind on-road vehicles when it comes to being able to resist ethanol damage. Again, there used to be concern about what effects that ethanol blends might have in cars, but now we know that that concern is really only limited to classic and antique cars from decades past. Cars from the last you know, 20, 25 years or so don't have any reason to be concerned about ethanol issues with respect to how it affects their fuel system materials. So we said small engines are significantly behind on-road vehicles. That fact is why small engine manufacturers have been so vehemently against any potential pushes towards raising the national limit from 10% ethanol to 15% ethanol in, in, in gasoline. Their argument is that it's going to it's going to damage their small engines uh, even more than than it has before, and they've got a point to be concerned about that. Um, another problem. Uh, uh, well, continuing damage to small engine discussion, what are the recommended solutions for this? Well, a couple of things. First recommendation would be housekeeping measures for small engines. When you're done using small engine, you want to drain the fuel out after you finish using the fuel. You don't want to leave large amounts of ethanol gasoline just sitting in that 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 small engine fuel system where it can just you know cause ongoing damage over time. And you want to treat the fuel with something that protects the small engine parts from ethanol solvency. Now, there's when it comes to this thing of you know treatment of you know with with an ethanol fuel add, there's a lot of choices out there. Um, so much so that people's eyes glaze over when they start looking at that kind of stuff. How do you know what is a good ethanol fuel treatment and what is a bad ethanol fuel treatment? Um, because you know it's it's one thing to be told that you need some kind of fuel treatment to protect your small engine and help it run better. When it comes down to making a decision, it can be a little daunting. We say base, for lack of a better way of putting it, because there's so much market noise out there. How do you know what's good, what's bad? How do you know what's worthless? How do you know which ones are worthwhile? Well, what I can tell you, <clears throat> as somebody who has been in the industry a long time on the fuel treatment side, there are some things you can look for, things you should look for, the things that a good ethanol fuel treatment should be able to do. Number one, you need something to protect polymer parts, polymer components from solvency damage. Now, a good fuel additive will do this by using a boundary protection mechanism. They'll have a fuel soluble protectant. When that fuel, when that when that treated fuel comes in contact with surfaces, that protectant will actually migrate. It will move towards those surfaces and will actually lay down a layer of protection that acts as a shield. It blocks the reactions that are associated with either the corroding of the materials or the dissolving of the polymer components. So first and foremost, a good quality ethanol fuel treatment should be able to do that. It should also definitely have detergency in it. You want detergency in it to clean the fuel system, clean the engine, ensure that vital areas stay clean and clear of deposits because that is the most important thing that's going to ensure that your equipment runs at its best. 
A good ethanol fuel treatment should also have something in it to improve the fuel's ability to resist phase separation and storage. Now, there are plenty of formulations that claim to be able to do this, but most of those do it by using an alcohol base. Basically, using alcohol to solve an alcohol problem, which is generally not the best way to go. And then finally, piece of general advice on this issue. Point number four. When you're confronted with a lot of different choices, they're all trying to, shall we say, differentiate themselves from each other. They're trying to stand out from the pack. So what you get is you get a bunch of them all raising their hands, all claiming to be able to do six or seven or eight different things at some you know, minute treat, treat rate, like uh, you know, one to you know, 50,000 gallons or something. You, know, you put a drop in your, ta your, your, your tank of fuel, and <clears throat> it will do everything but turn light into gold. Um, you know, they're trying to differentiate themselves. But when you're sorting through all of these competing claims, just remember that really effective, actually effective fuel additization is about chemistry. It is not about magic. You do need to have a certain amount of active ingredients in the fuel in order to do anything worthwhile in that fuel. And so if you have something that's claiming to do a lot of things, a really, really low tree rate, just think, just remember, if it sounds too good to be true, then it probably is. Um, your sweet spot is going to be, you know, if you have something that's like treats one, one ounce treats 10 gallons or one ounce treats 15 gallons, something like that, that's a reasonable treat rate for having enough active ingredients to actually do what it says it's supposed to do. But if you start getting up into one ounce to 30 gallons or one ounce to 50 gallons, and it's claiming to do all of these bunch of things, then you're just like, no. If it, ha if it feels the need to make those kind of claims, it's probably not go really going to do anything like what it says it's going to do. Next problem, phase separation and storage. For those of you who keep any significant amount of ethanol gasoline on hand for use, you have to be prepared to deal with the problem of phase separation. You do. You have to because it's going to happen eventually. There's no way around it. So simple definition of the problem, the separation of the ethanol from the ethanol blended fuel uh, leading to destruction or comprom compromising of the fuel's quality and significant loss of octane value. What is it caused by? Water absorption from the environment that is in, in excess of the fuel's ability to dissolve that water, which is what leads to the, fa the initiation of <clears throat> the phase separation process. Now, this is most commonly a B2B problem. Uh, most consumers don't store significant amounts of gasoline for long periods of time. Um, so in terms of pre preventive and remediative measures to help combat this, well, really the only thing, since you're not going to be able to keep the ethanol from attracting water, the only thing you can really do is use something in the fuel, a fuel treatment, that retards or delays phase separation and enables the fuel to absorb more water without separating than it would if the fuel treatment wasn't there. Now, as we've noted before, there are fuel added solutions for this. Many of them, many of those solutions attempt to do this by adding alcohol, you know, using alcohol to solve an alcohol problem. The best solutions on the fuel additive side do not use alcohol. Alcohol just simply exacerbates the problem in the fuel. So really the only way to get around this phase separation is to use something that uh, uh, helps the fuel dissolve more water without adding more alcohol. And uh, an additional note on this, as with other recommendations, such a treatment, you need really need to add it to the fuel before the phase separation problem manifests because once phase once fuel has started to phase separate, there's nothing cost effective you can put in that will reverse or put that phase separation back together again. Uh, storage tank corrosion, what we were just talking about a few minutes ago. 
The next significant problem, again, it's a problem for those who store ethanol gasoline for a significant amount of time. They have to worry about storage tank corrosion and damage to expensive tank parts. This damage comes from the water that's absorbed from the ethanol fuel, and it comes from the acids that are produced by the microbes that live in that storage tank uh, environment. Now, because corrosion in storage tanks is, is linked to both water presence and microbial presence, any preventive measure you take has to target those two areas. Now, in diesel storage tanks, if you were talking about this kind of problem, this corrosion problem in diesel tank, of which there are plenty of corrosion issues in diesel storage tanks, the common recommendation they would say is first thing you need to do, check the tank for water bottoms, when you find a water layer on the bottom, uh, remove it. Problem with that, doing that for ethanol is that if you happen to find a water bottom or a water layer phase in ethanol gasoline, that means that the gasoline has already undergone phase separation and you've got a, a, you know, a big problem there. So if you have stored ethanol fuels, you need to concentrate on controlling potential microbial growth in storage tanks. And how you do that is by using periodic biocide treatments. It's also advised by you know groups like the Environmental Protection Agency that you pair a biocide with an anti-corrosion storage tank treatment, something that's based on a filming amine or filming amide chemistries. These, these, these are used in fuel like a 1 to 10,000 or 1 to 20,000 tree rate. And what they do is they work kind of similar to what we were talking about a few minutes ago with uh, the, the, the ethanol fuel additive that protects uh, small engine parts. Laying that, it, it's a bound, what they call it, boundary protection mechanism. The treatment migrates to the tank surface and it lays down a layer of protection, a protective layer on the surfaces that the treated fuel comes in contact with and helps protect it against corrosion uh, on an ongoing basis. So, we have gone through a lot of information in the last hour or so. It's been a lot to take in. Let's do one final review of what we've covered and tie it all together. Okay. Uh, first thing, ethanol is added to gasoline because of the two overriding needs. Number one, the government mandate for making the gasoline better for the environment. And number two, the marketplace's mandates for making sure that the gasoline performs properly in the engine, that it has enough octane value. <clears throat> Unfortunately, adding this ethanol to gasoline causes problems in multiple areas, mostly due to how small engines react to it and how the ethanol has ethanol gasoline has poor storage life, not to mention how it contributes to the areas of storage tank corrosion. Now the solutions to these problems center on treating the fuel to blunt the chemical effects of the ethanol blend, whether it, whether it is a anti-corrosion or a, a cro an anti-corrosion protectant or a biocide treatment for a storage tank or or, it's, or something that helps the fuel resist phase separation. Those are all types of chemical solutions that are recommended to help solve these ethanol problems. Now, one thing up to this point that we have not really mentioned is possible use of ethanol-free gas, right? People say, well, if ethanol is causing a problem, simple solution is just don't use ethanol. Use ethanol-free gas. The reason why this isn't always a feasible solution is that it is not, by and large, readily available to everyone. Not to mention it can be significantly more expensive than, you know, ethanol blend gasoline. So the best recommendations for what to do about possible ethanol problems wherever you're at isn't going to be necessarily be me just saying, hey, just don't use ethanol blend gas, because that's not really feasible for most groups. Finally, since I mentioned you know, several different treatment recommendations for the fuel itself, there are some final points that we need to emphasize should you feel, should you, you feel that pursuing a fuel, fuel treatment for ethanol fuel is going to be the best decision for wherever you're at. Now, as we noted earlier, 
you know, apart from specialty biocide or anti-corrosion treatments, apart from those types of fuel treatments, you want to make sure that whatever ethanol fuel treatment you use, it helps with phase separation and it helps with protection of polymer materials and that it provides good detergency for that engine. You may also want to make sure that it is not something that makes wild claims about performing miracles at extremely low treat rates. Remember, if it sounds too good to be true in that regard, it likely is. And then the last couple of points here relate to questions that we have gotten from people who read or have heard things out there on the internet and they want then they have questions. <clears throat> the first one concerns reversing phase separation versus preventing phase separation. Now, our stance with respect to that is you need to use a fuel treatment, you need to treat ethanol fuel when it is fresh and it is healthy to prevent phase separation from happening. See, once ethanol fuel has started to undergo phase separation because it's absorbed too much water, once that process has started, there is nothing that will cost-effectively reverse phase separation. Now, you can, from a chemistry standpoint, it is possible to add enough of certain types of chemicals to cause the alcohol and the water to re redissolve back into the fuel. The problem, though, from a practical standpoint, is that you would have to use a lot of those kind of chemicals, and it would be really expensive to do that, not worth the hassle. That's why we say, practically, there's nothing that will cost-effectively reverse phase-separated fuel. Now, there is at least one product on the marketplace that does specifically claim to reverse phase-separated ethanol gasoline and make it good as new. And <clears throat> it's a product that's marketed towards the tank cleaning market. We have fuel polishers who encounter phase-separated fuel all the time, and they say, great, here's something that I can put in that tank, and when I'm filtering the fuel, it will make it, it will put Humpty Dumpty back together again, so to speak. But when you delve into the details about the product, what we find is that even the product itself only claims to be able to fix phase-separated fuel when it's just started to separate. And that is not what most consumers envision when they see claims about being able to fix phase-separated fuel. It's just not. So the last part, uh, people will hear claims about removing ethanol. See, there are do-it-yourselfers out there, people who are, you know, maybe die-hard anti-ethanol people, and they, they, their attitude is they want to shun ethanol altogether, and they recommend that people just remove it completely. And how do you remove ethanol from gasoline? Well, you add a whole bunch of water to that gasoline, you basically drop the ethanol out, and they say, great, problem solved, yay. <clears throat> this is a really bad idea, really bad idea. You're talking about flooding your gasoline with water in hopes of getting 10% ethanol content out of it. Not to mention, even if you were successful at doing that, you would then have to add an octane improver back into that fuel. And octane improvers are really expensive and hard to find. It's just not worth the trouble. You're better off treating the prob treating and preventing ethanol problems than attempting some some way of removing the ethanol alcohol itself. And then finally, again, if you see a fuel additive that makes claims about removing the ethanol itself, making it disappear, well, I'll stay away from that. There's no fuel additive that can just make ethanol disappear. You don't remove the ethanol, you treat the f ethanol blended fuel to negate or minimize any potential negative effects. So that brings us to the end of our discussion today. We've gone through a lot, uh, we've talked about a lot of different things. Um, if you have any questions, this is my uh, contact information here. Again, I am Eric Bjornstedt, I'm the Technical Information Director here at Bell. My email address is there on the screen, ebjornstead at bellperformance.net. If you have any questions about any of the things that I've talked about today, uh, send me an email. Easiest thing to do, send me an email. Uh, put that you were watching the uh, webinar on 
you know, preventing ethanol problems in stored fuel, and you had a question, I will be more than happy to help you in whatever way I can. So that concludes our webinar training today uh, on solutions for storing and using ethanol gasoline. Once again, I'm Eric Bjornstad, Technical Information Director here at Bell Performance. One last thing. We have a number of great resources on our website, which, as you may imagine, is bellperformance.com. I uh, encourage you, if you have uh, um, uh, any questions about things that we've talked about, definitely go and check some of the things out there. We have a lot of resources, a lot of great blog posts on the topic. Um, you may find that you get your questions answered uh, that way as well. So anyway, thank you very much for joining me today. and. We will uh, see you next time.